My name is Alex Balashov, and I'm from Every Systems in Northeast Georgia. And I'm going to talk to you about some trends in uh, the stampede to the cloud that service providers in the SIP world have made in the last uh, couple of years. And um, just a little bit about us. Uh, we do primarily Camellio focused uh, large scale platform architecture work for service providers based in Athens, Georgia. It's a little college town about an hour east of Atlanta. And we also have a class four routing product. And really we're more from the Camellio part of the universe than the asterisk part of the universe at this point. Uh, we also have a blog on you know, free and open source of web related technical topics and provide SIP protocol fundamentals and Camellio training. And we've been in that business for about 12 years. So let me just uh, jump right in here and say the folk wisdom about ITSP infrastructure from the mid 2000s is that you, you know, that hosted systems and virtualization doesn't really work for cloud, and I mean for, for ITSPs. And we know that to be not true today. But if you go rewind your mental clock to 2005, 2006, the, the early days of very software defined virtualization, et cetera, et cetera, and a public IP backbone that really wasn't adequate to support decent uh, you know, tow grade voice quality. The presumption was that you know, ITSP infrastructure is special because it does real time communications. So you need a big and serious box with dedicated and ample hardware in a very centralized manner and that anything that remotely smacks of cloud is hostile to media performance and real time uh, communications of any kind. And that was true even when you know, AWS first appeared on the scene. And what has happened, of course, since that time, as we all know, I think, in this room, is that the public IP backbone has slowly got better. Not perfect, but you can now provide SIP trunking over the internet, both in the class four, you know, intra-industrial context and in the retail SIP trunking space. And these are things you can now do, and it's, it's good enough. It's not perfect, but the 2005, 2006 era presumption that you know if you want good quality you have to buy a dedicated link is no longer true. Well the same thing has happened to cloud and virtualization. Uh, there used to be a presumption that well you know, cloud uh, involves uh, and virtualization is a very heavily software intermediated layer of bureaucracy that and the I.O. scheduling and contention environment inside VMs is anathema to good voice quality. And what has happened is all that has changed. Um, as you probably know, virtualization has become kind of a first class uh, CPU feature set uh, in the sense that VM guests are not quite exactly like running on bare metal nowadays, but getting very close to it in terms of direct hardware access and so forth. And a lot of this technology has evolved in both on the networking and the virtualization side. So as a result, service providers have stampeded into cloud over the last couple of years, uh, especially greenfield platform and application endeavors. And what I mean by that is if you're going to build a new application today, uh, especially a large scale application like, I don't know, say a contact center product, you're thinking about how to do this, you're probably not going to rack and stack and platform your own stuff. You're going to think about how to architect it for one of the cloud providers. or at the very least, some sort of hybrid, you know, VPS and VM based infrastructure from a data center partner. But, uh, you know, this has been going on long enough that we now have some feedback on what actually works and what doesn't. If we were having this talk in 2012, 2013, it's like, well, I don't know, it's too new. We, we now have some perspective on what actually works and what doesn't when you try to deploy app, VoIP application and service provider endeavors into this type of infrastructure. So to kind of go back to what I was just saying, uh, there's a kind of big fat box model of telecom infrastructure that has predominated and has been the conventional wisdom for much of this time. And that's the big fat server with lots of CPU cores, lots of RAM. 
uh, and massively centralized resources, SSDs, big and expensive. And the administration of it was to one degree or another, depending on who was providing it, whether it's a lease dedicated or whether it's owned and operated by you, was fundamentally your responsibility as a piece of infrastructure. Even if a, ser a data center was providing a lease dedicated server to you as you know, responsible for the bare metal part of it, uh, this is your server. And in order to take advantage of a hardware setup like that, you need to design your application to exploit massively centralized resources in an efficient way. So you make big use of a big database with lots of I.O., lots of RAM, centralized infrastructure, centralized componentry, and a focus on optimizing throughput, you know, as a matter of economies of scale across aggregate hardware. So, uh, for example, just to make fun of our own product, which is based on the same premise today, you know, you're typically going to have a master and a slave server with some componentry that uh, runs on both and is capable of some degree of failover, but it really tries to exploit the resources of the uh, big fat box. As you move to cloud, there's a couple realizations that start to sink in uh, if you move to cloud, and we'll talk about whether that actually makes any sense. But the number one mistake that we see service providers make is taking the big fat box architecture that their service provider infrastructure was built on and just putting it on some hosted VMs or slices as is. There's a couple of reasons, both economic and technical, why that's not really a viable proposition. But in most cases, when you are taking something that was designed to exploit the properties of the big central box, with the massive resources and you put it on AWS, Azure, Google Compute Platform, whatever the case may be, something from your data center, you probably need to re-architect the entire thing in order to make optimal economic and technical use of cloud as, uh, as intended by nature. Uh, so, there is a subtle distinction between simply running stuff on someone else's computers and really getting cloud. And if you don't feel this at a technical level, you will certainly feel it at a pricing level. Because if you take something like our product as its current generation works today, and you try to throw it into AWS, you're gonna end up with a $3,000 a month instance if you run our recommended specs for to get resources that you know, you can get for $100 a month out of a least dedicated server. <laughs> so, big centralized instances obviously violate the entire cloud over subscription and resource contention model, and so the pricing won't support it. Uh, if you simply take your big centralized application, you put it in the cloud, and you give it the resources that it theoretically needs, you're going to end up paying an arm and a leg, and you will not be saving any money, and that you're, you're not getting it if that's what you're doing. Cloud native service and application characteristics instead involve you know, distributed infrastructure, lots of small instances, dynamic discovery and self-assembly, elasticity, and in general, a dimensioning of the componentry that is rationalized to the types of host instances or container instances that now you're now using. So those of you who have dealt at all with moving applications from a centralized infrastructure to a distributed one have encountered these problems in the past, except now there's a pricing dimension to it. So you can't just take your big centralized components, break them up a little bit, throw them on some servers, and bam, we're in the cloud. I mean, you, you can, but you will reap neither the technical nor the economic advantages of doing so and will probably just end up paying a lot more money. So the pitch that traditionally sells cloud, of course, is to, to, the, to the suits, to the C-suite, is that we can fire the system admins, reduce you know, operations, headcount, and reduce infrastructure spending and OPEX in general. The idea is, hey, you know, 
we employ these overpaid gophers that don't really do much except, uh, you know, the one time that we have a 3 a.m. disaster and several hard drives have failed in the sand and somebody needs to run down to the data center and swap them out and, oops, some of the parity data is missing and somebody needs to rebuild an XFS file system block by block over a degraded rate array. That's what they're for. And we're in the VoIP applications business and that's not really what we want to be doing. Why are we spending money on all these people? Let's, uh, let's get rid of most of that and have the, the Amazon genie take care of it or the soft layer genie or whoever. It doesn't really matter. The, the, the rack space genie, the, the vulture genie. And that is the theory that sells cloud to the business people. So as you can imagine, given the narrative arc of this presentation, this is a setup for the position, the point of view that that doesn't quite turn out as expected. So let me briefly touch on a couple of kind of infrastructural economic factors for ITSPs before I move on to the part that I think is the more interesting coefficient in this equation. Uh, as I said before, big instances are very expensive. Cloud providers really, really want you to buy lots of small ones. So, for example, we have a Camellio-based platform that we support for a customer that has lots of RTP relays. And the reason it has lots of them is because you can't have one big one. Not only does it cost way too much, but they often have, in the case of AWS, have undeclared and unpublished packet per second and bandwidth limits associated with those instances. So you may provision an instance that is expensive, has sufficient CPU and RAM and all the resources that you think it needs in order to support, you know, I don't know, a couple hundred concurrent calls. Just plain old G711 RTP relay. And what you find is that suddenly, you know, you've, you are redline at 15 megabits of RTP and after that you start having call quality issues and nobody told you that. And that's because uh, all these cloud platforms are really invented for web weenies and asynchronous operations that weren't really tailored to the demands of real-time communications. They're slowly improving their ability to deliver the, that, type of, uh, that, that type of ask, but that's not really what cloud is for, and you run into those kinds of technical limits all the time when you start uh, provisioning instances in an inertial manner that carries forward your instinct to kind of over-provision, make big instances, devote lots of resources to componentry. Because what AWS and friends really want you to do is to take your medium RTP relay instance and turn it into seven small ones. And in fact, the pricing will incentivize that. And the, the problem for you is gonna be not so much the pricing side of this picture, but more the okay, how do I dynamically spin them up, spin them down, and communicate to a central controller that they're active and make use of them kind of thing. Um, it's cloud, so there's gonna be some scheduling contention and hypervisor issues, depending on what's actually running on the hardware. Network and reachability issues that are sort of invented by the nature of the cloud platform rather than really being reducible to fundamentals. So if, those of you who have dealt with AWS know the pain of trying to network several availability zones together. Either you have to buy their you know, $400 a month VPN tunnel or invent your own and sometimes jump through a lot of hoops and create a lot of contrivances in order to do that. Um, they have solutions for all of this, but you know, they're a la carte line items on your bill, which inevitably goes up and up as you run into the economic obstacles of trying to do things the old way, but now the new way. Um, so are you going to save money in this situation? Well, maybe. Um, I have a couple of customers who definitely went in the, did the opposite of that and spend more on their cloud infrastructure than ever. <laughs> and it keeps growing every month. Their Amazon bill is twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a month. And uh, when you start trying to solve some of the problems the cloud poses for you without re-architecting your application, inevitably that's where you're going to end up. So will you improve risk and availability though? Or will you solve the 3 a.m. hard drive failure problem? Well, yeah. Um, true enough, that's not your responsibility anymore. But 
you are going to run into different kinds of availability and infrastructure and OPEX challenges instead. So it reshapes the problem from a technical perspective. But the people factor is really the most important one. Uh, cloud really is a very different way of doing things. I don't mean that it's some rupture with history or a singularity, although hmm, there's, there's probably a lot of consulting money to be made in peddling that point of view. Hmm, I want to jot that down for later. Hmm. It can make you a visionary. Uh, no, cloud is not qualitatively distinct from what came before it, but it, it is a different wave of thinking. And we're going to talk about that in just a second. But I think if there's one takeaway from this presentation that you need from a sort of human capital side, it's that you need to be doing DevOps as a means of uh, managing your infrastructure. What are we doing on time over here? All right. DevOps. What's DevOps? Well, there's a lot of definitions of DevOps and plenty of visionaries and consultants who get paid big money to articulate what DevOps is. But, and it's a somewhat contentious topic, but it entails two things in my eyes. So traditionally, the corporate world has a distinction, at least large, medium to large organizations have a distinction between engineering and operations, which means that traditionally, there's people who write the code and there's people who deploy the code and manage the infrastructure on which the code runs. Those people obviously communicate to some degree, but they're fundamentally different parts of the company. That's the old way of doing things. That's the way, when I started my career, that was the way of doing things. And I somehow ended up in the operations track, even though I was really a developer, but because, precisely because I was unaware of this distinction. And so what ends up happening is, at least according to the sort of a mental caricature of this model, is you have people whose responsibility basically ends when the programming text editor or the IDE closes, and people whose respons you know, responsibility begins at that point where we actually put this stuff in the real world. And so unfortunately, the people who deployed the code had no deep understanding of how it works. You know, they had some understanding. You have to have some understanding. But it wasn't really a software engineering level understanding. And development was seen to be kind of a free-floating endeavor that was unrelated to the infrastructure that it runs on. So I'm going to write some code, and then I've got my platform people to you know, platform it or whatever. And that was how things ran. And these are entirely you know, two different divisions of the company. So DevOps tries to fuse these two camps. Uh, and I think even large organizations, even enterprise, recognize the benefits. And you know, if done right, what that's going to get you is smaller teams that are more capable, that see both sides of this equation. But definitely, that's going to make big, bigger demands on their skills. And they will be more highly compensated. Uh, will you save money that way? It depends. So the skill sets involved are really the fusion of development and system administration skill sets and knowledge. So if you work in small business, you already do this because you've taken for granted that sysadmin type people, you know, even if they're not software engineers per se, they have to write scripts, utilities, glue, uh, shell scripts, you know, PHP utilities, cron jobs, things like that. But though that's not the way things work in big companies, though. In big companies, there's people in this entire area of the cube farm who, uh, who the moment that you have to introduce a while or a for loop into a situation, all that, 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 that's the job of the programming department. We don't do that. We're, we're server people, see. And those are the truly endangered folks in this changing environment. Um, as more and more infrastructure becomes software defined, and I don't mean just in terms of you know, NFV and SDN, but also you know, like, well, when you make proper use of a platform like AWS, you've got things like you know, it's built in load balancing componentry and software articulated routing like Route 53 and the Beanstalk and this and that and Informix and its various hosted databases and its you know, container as a service thing, what's it called, Lambda. Infrastructure has moved higher up the call stack but requires a more software oriented view in order to properly comprehend it. It has moved away from the dedicated appliance and uh, bo packaged infrastructural box model. We have things like virtual software switches and virtual routers. And in general, things are moving in that direction. 
but they're moving in that direction in a, in a way where you're not just taking the functionality of the hardware box and you're putting it in software, but you're also exposing some of the innards and the control knobs and dials to the operator. Management of large host fleets, which as I mentioned, the pricing and the overall logic of the cloud environment sort of incent you know, is in incentivizes it, leads to a more programmatic way of managing infrastructure at a large scale. Even if it's declarative, if you're using, you know, Chef, Puppet, Salt Stack, Ansible, whatever. Uh, even if you th think you're filling out a template that describes in YAML or XML or whatever, what you want the host to be like, and then it just simply implements that vision for you, you probably know that declarative becomes imperative very quickly. <laughs> These are all pseudo-programmatic type tasks from a cognitive and skill-based point of view. Uh, so the tooling involves concepts that migrate higher up the abstraction call stack, and that leads to more programming. And of course, other tr con concurrent trends that aren't necessarily rela related, like test-driven development and complex dependencies and various novel integration mechanisms, you know, CI, Jenkins, et cetera, et cetera. These are all things that lead to pipelines that require more programming to deploy. So things just don't work the way they used to. And of course, an understanding of the cloud provider's platform and CAN services is part and parcel of making use of this effectively. So um, there's a guy named Frank Camaro who wrote a really nice article. It's not the first or the fifth or the tenth or the twentieth article that complains about uh, the complexity of modern web development, but he's a web designer. He wrote one of my favorite philosophical articles on this subject. It's called Everything Easy is Hard Again. So he's a designer, and he's talking about the, the, the website of all this. But he's a keen observer of technical trends that apply here in this situation, too. So in particular, what Frank says is, you know, I wonder if I have 20 years of experience making websites or if it's really five years of experience repeated four times. And there's a, oh, the last one ran late. Um, it ran late by about 10 minutes. All right, um, what do you want me to do? <laughs> All right, so uh, that's, a, that's a trend that you're gonna see in infrastructure management. And in particular, and that's what the graph there is about, uh, you're gonna, you're going you're gonna to see that, um, you know, as Frank says, nothing stays settled. So, of course, a person with one year of experience and one with 15 years, years of experience can both be confused. That's not to say that they end up in equivalent positions, but they end up in similar positions. And things are so often only understood by those who are well positioned in the middle of the current wave of thought. So if, you've, if, if you're before the sweet spot in the wave, your inexperience means you know nothing, and if you're after it, you will know lots of things that aren't applicable to that particular way of doing things. And that's really important when it comes to the human capital side of cloud. So who can you hire to deal with cloud infrastructure? Well, you can hire veteran sysadmins who are schooled in Unix folk traditions and have a lot of perspective. A lot of these folks are cranky and jaded. They're kind of like me, dinosaurs. Like, well, oh, here we go again. Everything old is new again. Uh, those people will typically note the irony that cloud very strongly resembles uh, uh, mainframe computing and time-sharing systems of yore. But the good thing, of course, is that you know, they have strong Linux, Unix fundamental knowledge, which remains as important as ever. The cloud generation, of course, and I'm not implying that it's a particular age cohort. I know a guy in his late 60s who's really, really good at cloud. Um, they take for granted things that have existed in the last 10 years, uh, virtualization, elastic storage, microservices, and containers, and are fluid in proprietary cloud componentry and the proper nouns that come with that. Aren't necessarily comfortable SSHing into servers and doing things per se, and are easily hindered by classical kind of Linux, Unix environmental challenges. But in this new environment, that may not matter so much. So, the difference between these two categories, of course, is that your veteran sysadmins are going to have, I mean, the, the, the traditional pitch is that they have perspective, far-reaching perspective. The cloud folks are going to have a certain amount of raw skills that just by virtue of the, you know, sort of the, the accumulated cognitive burden of being a veteran sysadmin is such that two-thirds of what you know is going to be parasitic drag 
even though it will occasionally inform your experience and be useful. So in conclusion, and I am trying to hurry this along, uh, as a matter of infrastructure cost and unit economics, you should not assume that moving to cloud will deliver OPEX savings. Much depends on the architecture of your application and service and exactly how well positioned you are to exploit the specific modalities of the cloud platform that you're using. As a matter of human capital, and that's the, uh, to me that's the more important part of this because I mean, for service providers, what's their biggest expense other than perhaps carrier bills? Well, it's payroll. Uh, the need for operations as such is as high as ever, but the, the nature of that paradigm has changed. And the typical skill set requirement for infrastructure engineers has actually crept up. So the really endangered species here are sysadmins who are living in the big box age and haven't made that adjustment, who are accustomed to doing lots of racking and stacking and gophering in the data center, but can't move much beyond that. Um, but at the same time, you need to carefully weigh the trade-offs between hiring veterans of the, you know, the, the infrastructure server Linux Unix world and people who are very fluent in the vocabularies of cloud at the expense of not knowing much about the reasons for why those things came about. And in all cases, the trade-offs that you make will determine the savings that you realize and the availability and durability benefits that you reap. So um, what I'm really saying is that when you squeeze one part of the balloon, you obviously end up inflating another one. And there are thermodynamic limits to what you can achieve with cloud. And it's not a magic panacea for anything. And I would, I have several times in my career now encountered the thesis from executive management, upper management, that, well, if we just move to cloud, we can get rid of all these system administrator and operations people. Those people are smoking crack, and I mean, the good crack. Uh, that's not what happened to their infrastructure, and that's not what happened to their teams. It's just not what happened. If anything, I mean, they may have contracted, consolidated, the headcount may have got smaller, but the overall expenditure has actually gone up because the skill sets that they need uh, to effectively make use of a more software-defined infrastructure environment have actually become more specialized and more rigorous. That's all I've got. Thank you very much. And um, I guess we're running about <clears throat> 10, 15 minutes behind. Um, that was true when I came in as well, for better or for worse. All right.